We're excited that you're here this evening. We're, I, I have the feeling we're going to be one of those small but mighty groups tonight. And um, so I just want to kind of go over the ground rules so that we know where, what we're doing. We have an august panel here tonight, people who have put in a lot of time and uh, a lot of caring. And so um, I think you're really, those of you who are we the public have no idea how many people are in this room that are involved in this issue of police and community. So I, before we start, how many of you are community activists? Raise your hand, please. Okay, no. see, oh, see that hand down here? I just moved Nobody it. saw that. <laughs> Nobody saw that. Okay, raise that hand up, okay? Okay, and how many are students? Okay, great. You older than smoke. You learn something every day. Okay, 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 okay. And how many are, are police officers? Okay. All right. And how many are retired teachers? All right, Sydney, come on, raise your hand. All right, thank you very much. All right, so um, what we're doing here tonight is to have an opportunity to share to hear from uh, different people in the ranks. And um, so our speakers tonight are Joanne Hardesty from the Portland NAACP and a former state legislator. State legislator. Mm -hmm. Daryl Turner, former office officer, a still police still officer. officer. Still, still, <laughs> still an officer, <laughs> but president, <laughs> president of the Portland Police Association. Mike Krebs, who is the uh, Assistant Chief of Police for Portland Police, and Kathleen Sadat, who is the Chair of the COAP, which is the, uh, okay, so the brain just went blank, Community, Community Oversight Advisory Board. So, um, and I don't know, I have not heard from Reverend Bethel or Reverend Haynes as to whether or not they will be here or not, but uh, Joanne knows a lot of the stuff that they do, and so she could share it if she wants to. So, um, so there's just a few things. There's some housekeeping. Back at the back door, down the steps are the restrooms. Uh, when you get to the bottom of the steps, turn to the left. Those are the important rooms. There's refreshments back there if you'd like to have them. Uh, we also have a brochure. We have several things at the tables in the little buckets there. This is for writing notes, anything you want to take down. There's pens. Uh, each of you should have an agenda that tells the, the order of the program, and you, you're going to see these little things in there with the brochures, and you're wondering, what are these little things? You know how people always say, I would give you my number except I don't have a card? <laughs> except now you have a card. <laughs> so everybody has a card. All right. So um, what I'd like to do is share with you very quickly um, Tonight is Community Police Forum, and our next one is at uh, Cleveland, March 28th, on a Monday, uh, in the Cleveland High School cafeteria. We're going to see if we can get more people turned out. Uh, Officer Schober and I are going to go on a campaign and see if we can't get some more stuff happening. So those people who, who now who are my students? Raise your hand again. One, two. We might have to get some of you to get you two in the commercials too. So we're going to do some PSA. So make sure you give me your number and everything. You're not a student? You're a mom. I'm getting old. Okay. Don't mind, Don't mind me. Okay. So McMinimum's Kennedy School, uh, the first Tuesday, second Tuesday of the month is March 8th. Uh, that's next month. And the film is called Lessons of Basketball and War. And it's about three tribes of uh, Somalian girls who came to this country, and they don't get along. The tribes don't normally get along. Mm -hmm. And the principal, Kevin Bacon, I, I need to say that, principal, Kevin Bacon, I forgot about the other Kevin Bacon, got some phone calls saying, is it the Kevin Bacon? <laughs> like, yeah, the principal, Kevin Bacon. <laughs> so uh, he and the director are gonna, going to do a Q&A, and it's a film about how the girls learn to get along and to play basketball at the same time. So it's a very interesting and very moving film. Um, if, we, if you turn to the very back of the brochure, this is a very important part of it, and I like to take a little time doing this. Um, it's the ground rules, and one of the things that people have said uh, in come, the police have said in coming to race talks is that 
they like coming here because it is a civil discussion and people are not screaming and hollering at the police. And like I said, I'm a third grade teacher. We are not doing that. Everybody has to act nice. So, and you know, and when you get into the, to the, um, to the, the ground rules, it explains why it works. Listen to each other with curiosity. You don't know what the person's gonna say and make no assumptions about that you know what they're going to say or what their story is all about. Respect differences, agree to disagree. My experience has been when you go to a forum and people are screaming and hollering, is that folks are trying to convince somebody else of what their opinion is. You don't have to, I don't have to agree with your opinion, but I do need to listen to it. So just listen to what other people have to say, ask questions about it. They might give you some input that will help change your opinion, or maybe you can change their opinion by being respectful and listening to theirs. Um, speak from the self and from the heart. Um, I have a tendency to say, I know somebody who, and I do know somebody who, but that's not my story. I need to tell my story and talk about what, what is for me. Respect confidentiality. When, because you're a part of a discussion, you have a right to go share that discussion with other people, but you don't have a right to go say, you know, I was talking to Joe, who lives on 59th Street and works at the substation, and he said, that's not okay. You can share that someone said, and, but not who said it, and not be specific about the information. Contribute honestly and positively. For some people, that's really hard. I remember um, working for the state of California and this woman said, I've decided I'm gonna quit lying. And she was a manager for one of the big departments and she was kind of up there and I said, well, what do you mean you're gonna quit lying? Well, I'm just not gonna lie anymore. And I thought, oh boy, we're in trouble. Because if you're a person in a position of power and you're lying, what else, what kind of position have you done for other people's lives when you're making decisions and you're not being honest? Assume positive intent. People will put their foot in their mouths. Understand that. You're gonna put your foot in your mouth. I'm gonna put my foot in my mouth. We're going to say things that at some time or another will offend other people. Give people the benefit of the doubt. Ask for clarification for what they're saying. What do you mean by that? Um, and, and just assume that they're trying to be positive. Most people are not trying to be dirty dogs. Some people are, but most are not. Uh, be open to new ideas. And uh, a white friend of mine said, I need to put this one in here, it was not originally in here, you may experience discomfort. And he said, white people do not like to talk about race. So they will be just uncomfortable. So I just thought I'd put it in there. So it's okay, if you, if you are, then you know that it's okay. And then relax and enjoy. Uh, we want you to have a nice time. We want you to make acquaintances here. Uh, these little cards. We want you to get to know people. The only, I'm big on the R word, and I don't mean race. I'm big on the relationship word. And that is the only way that we're gonna change this world. By the year 2040, there will be more people of color than there are white people in the United States. And a lot of the insanity that we're seeing, which is mostly happening from white males, is fear. It is fear and it's anxiety and not understanding what is in the future. And uh, Asa Hilliard, Dr. Asa Hilliard, said that the four things that cause problems between countries and people is ignorance, fear, envy, and greed. I should say ignorance, envy, fear, and greed. Ignorance, I see you, I don't understand you, I don't know what you're about. Um, maybe you look like you're doing a little bit better than I am, or, or you have something I want. And then there's the fear, well maybe you're gonna get ahead, maybe you're gonna get more of it than I am. And then there's the greed, I'm gonna go get it, so I'll have all of it for myself. There's plenty enough for everybody. There's plenty enough for everybody. So this is an opportunity to get to know folks, uh, make no assumptions about who people are or what their story is. So please sit back, enjoy. If you just have a little discomfort, go get a, get a cookie. <laughs> Pretend they're warm, it'll be okay. <laughs> and so our speakers are going to have, uh, we're starting a little late and that's okay. Um, our speakers are gonna have eight minutes, eight, yeah, eight to 10 minutes each to speak and tell your story. You, got, you already saw your email earlier today. <laughs> I think we remember, don't you? Well, okay.
You can help us out. Okay. All right. Well, so here's what you're going to talk about. <laughs> you're going to you're going to basically tell what what you do and what your uh, involvement is with community police relations. Um, kind of a little bit of your story, what you do, what you'd like to see done, and what role you're playing in this. And you all play very distinct roles, and so, all right. And I'm, I'm taking a key time. So who's going to go first? OK. I'll go first. Uh, I speak loud enough, but I, I'm Mike Krebs. I'm one of the assistant chiefs here at the Portland Police Bureau. Can everybody hear him? Okay, and uh, I've been a police officer now. I got hired February 1980 back in Salt Lake City, Utah. So I've been doing this job a long time, and I moved to Portland in 1992. Uh, I'm currently assigned to the chief's office, and the big thing for me right now is I have the personnel division, and the personnel division is the organ of the the, the uh, division in our in our bureau that actually does all the hiring, and right now we're having a very very difficult time of hiring people. Uh, it's my belief that the uh, the Portland Police was very unique. Uh, you can some agencies are saying that uh, some of the smaller agencies are trying to uh, take officers from the Portland Police Bureau, and some officers are actually leaving. And my job is to try to retain them and try to hire good police officers because the Portland people is unique. And I was talking to a, a woman here earlier, and you know, one of the things when I first got hired in the 80s, it was kind of this warrior mentality. It was the, uh, the police have to go home at all costs. The police are, it's almost us versus them. And that's how I got hired in the 1980s, and that went, went on for many, many years. And the kind of people we're looking for now are guardians guardians of the community, people that are here to be guardians, to work with the community, to call this their own community, and to work with them to make it a nice and safe place. When you act like a guardian, rather than being us versus them, it's just us working together. You know, there's a, uh, a big piece for me is, is that the people in the community have to be able to trust their police. And if they think they're warriors or us versus them, there's not gonna be a trust there. So Chief uh, Larry O'Day, one of the, the biggest things he talked about when he took office a year ago is developing that relationship and that trust with the community. And what that really comes down to for me is actually having a personal relationship with people, get to know their name, have a discussion, you know, go out to coffee with them. I see people in this room right now, I, you know, Robin Weisner, and I'm meeting with Bruce but in a couple of weeks, you know, and I want to just go out and connect with folks. And that's what we want our police officers to do, is just go out there and connect with people. And just by that alone, we develop trust. And so when things go really, really bad, that trust is there. You can go, come together and have conversation because you trust each other. And I think that's probably the, the biggest thing right now in the Portland Police Bureau is to have the community and the police trusting each other. And there are, uh, it, it, um, right now, as I mentioned earlier, is that we're having a hard time hiring folks. And uh, one thing I'm not going to do with the Portland Police Bureau is lower our standards. Uh, what, I, what I'm afraid of is we lower our standards to get a quick fix, and then five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten years from now, we, we reap what we, reap what we sow. And so I'm not willing to, to lower the standards. I've had people talk to me about that, about, well, should our background be a little, little less? Should our psychological tests be a little different? And right now, I think that uh, I'm willing to change those things as long as we don't lower the standard, because I'm not willing to give the community five, six years down the road a subpar police officer. And so to get in this organization, you're going to have to be some of the best there are out there and be able to connect with folks. Um, I think that's pretty much about it. Uh, one thing I, I can say is, is that when the chief uh, uh, first came in, he actually expanded the chief's office. He went from four branches, to, uh, went from three branches to four branches to make the community services branch, which is, uh, allows more of the uh, chiefs and assistant chiefs to get out and connect with the community. So the chief has made it as uh, a big piece of his to get out and connect. Uh, one thing is before I end is that if anybody's looking to be hired as a police officer, I have my card, because uh, we are uh, trying to find a, maybe about 80 good folks that want to get hired at the Portland Police Bureau. So that's what I have. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
That's all I really have. I think I can. Can you hear me in the back? I think you need to be a little loud. I can. Ladies before gentlemen. I'd like to be last. The clock is starting. Go. Okay, I'll go. Uh, my name is Kathleen Sadat, and I am the chair for the Community Oversight Advisory Board. What I'm supposed to do is tell you what I do. Okay. I am going to stand up. My job title is one of the longest job titles in the world. <laughs> what I do, I was hired by what, what is referred to as the COPA, which is the body the group out of Chicago that was hired to oversee the implementation of a settlement agreement between Portland, uh, the city of Portland, slash the Portland Police Bureau, and the Department of Justice at the United States level. So federal, city, police department. Settlement agreement over the issue of the violation of the constitutional rights of those people who have mental health issues are perceived to have mental health issues. Okay. That came out of their investigation, and we have a settlement agreement. A part of that settlement agreement includes establishing an oversight board that is made up of community members. They're selected in various ways, and I'm not even sure I can explain all of it to you. <laughs> Some are selected by individual city council people. Some are appointees from existing boards or commissions that have an investment in this issue. And others are community members who have been selected by a community, a group of community folks who said, these are the people we want on this board. <coughs> it's a 50, and the other five people are the five people appointed by the chief of police to serve on this board as advisors to the board. They are non-voting members, but they give us information and ideas on how to move forward with advising on policy, procedure, whatever happens to come up in a discussion that may be relevant to this, this board can do that kind of recommendation. I got involved because I was asked if I would take the job of chair. And after talking with several people in the community, uh, I said, okay, I'll do this. One of the reasons is uh, just watching what happens over time and what has happened over time in terms of not just police community relations, but community community relations. And having been involved as an activist, heavily involved with the Kendra James case and being involved in that and thinking, one more time, we're making a lot of noise. Where are we going? We're making a lot, a lot of noise. Where are we going? And this came along and said, hey, we can go somewhere. Now, the reason we are in this place has to do with the work of a lot of people, including Joanne Hardesty, Dan Handel, the Albana Ministerial Coalition. For years and years of work and thinking and working and advocating, and finally getting this raised up. And here people are paying attention to it. Now, what I saw the first thing was, it's big. This is big. This is not small. And it's an opportunity that didn't exist before in terms of having an impact on policy. That is an impact that is mandated by the settlement agreement. That is to be reviewed by the settlement agreement. In other words, the board does not direct, the board does not set policy, but there is a requirement that that policy, whatever their recommendations are, be looked at by those who are setting policy. 
It's also an opportunity for people who have not done this part of the work to learn how this part of the work works. <coughs> it's an opportunity to get some understanding on the complexities of government, if nothing else. And it's not a straightforward thing. People think it's A, B, C. It's not. It's A, B, Q, R. See me next Tuesday. <laughs> what I would like to see is just friendly people. Now, that's, just, that's the simplest way to put it. Just friendly people. People who say, hello. <laughs> How are you? Did you have a good day? Can I show you where the is? I grew up in the 40s in black St. Louis, Missouri where a white officer walked the streets every evening and said, good evening, Miss Gunnell, to my grandmother, taking his hat off, because men took their hats in those days and they wore hats. And we were not afraid of that person. By the time I was 15 and living in Chicago, Mayor Daley was the mayor there. It was horrible. Beatings. Bribes, <coughs> corrupt, a really corrupt police department. And then we change, and there's the 60s, and there's fear, and there's fear on both sides, and there are divisions, and communities no longer are stable, but are moving and mobile. And so the whole dynamic changes, <coughs> and we haven't caught up with the dynamic, and we haven't figured out a way to make it all work to the advantage of all of us. So I'm here because I'm basically a person who wants to see a peaceful coexistence with people. I don't want to have a fight where there is a particular winner. What I want is a creative interaction that gives us something new. If we take the same old widgets and move them around, we don't have anything new. We just have movable widgets. So the first question is, do we need widgets? or ice cream cones, or bicycles, or what? What do we need to have that thing happen that would allow us to talk with one another about the issues that confront in an honest way? And I think we're often dishonest in that discourse because we have to present. We have to stay true to images that either we have adopted because of our maybe because of our culture, which could be of the police bureau, or our skin color, or our whatever. Whatever postures sometimes need to be gone. They just need to go away, the posture. The other piece of all this for me is, when I think about it more and more, what is the role of forgiveness in a social justice, economic justice movement? And this is part of that movement. It is a movement for justice. Now, can we get there if we don't think about how we're going to forgive? I hear people talk about trust a lot. And I guess I walk in with the idea that I trust you until you mess up. And when you mess up, I trust you to mess up again. That's how my trust goes. But I do not assume if we are in the same room saying we are looking for the same things, I assume we, what we have to do is discuss what those same things are so we identify them, but I do not assume you are there as the enemy. So that's what I wanted to bring to this work. Those, that thinking, that heart, that perspective, because it has, what gets in the way is that suspicion. And it's, I won't even call it hatred, I call it fear. And I did say to the previous chief of police, you guys don't need diversity training as much as they need fear management training. That means not being afraid of yourself or the other person. Because there's two people involved in that interaction. And I believe that same fear management needs to happen on my side or the people who feel victimized by all of us. I think it's a long road, but that's what I'd like to bring. My name is Daryl Turner. I am the president of the Portland Police Association, which uh, approximately 900 members, the rank and file police officers of the Portland Police Bureau. 
Uh, I am happy to say I am the president of the finest police officers in the nation, rank and file. I am proud to say that uh, our police officers are here to serve our community. We're here to try to get, we're here to build on community trust. We are here to serve that community the best way we can. The evolving community, especially in the city of Portland, is a different dynamic than many other cities. And those police officers navigate that dynamics very well. There's always work to be done. There will always be always work to be done. But I have been nationwide. I've seen other police agencies. And I'm convinced we're the best police agency in the nation. And we're more progressive, more moving forward than many police agencies that you'll see anywhere else. And we do that on our own, even before the Department of Justice came to the city of Portland. Like I said, that doesn't mean there's not work to be done. We know there's work to be done. My job is twofold. Um, my job as a labor union president is to oversee and listen to our members, the rank and file officers, and be able to manage a, a labor agreement, wages, benefits, make sure that we advocate for the members' rights. But my job also is to make sure but my job also is to make sure that we serve the community in a way that the community wants to be served with accountability on all sides. Accountability, obviously, for the police officers, accountability for management of the police bureau, but also accountability for the community. We want to make sure that everybody's accountable. We want to make sure that we're accountable to the community, that we give the community information they need to understand why we do what we do. Even when there's a disagreement, we want to be able to give them that information. Those are the things that I believe are important to community engagement. I believe we also, uh, like Ms. Sada said, go out. We need to be out there every day talking to people in the community. These are the things we were taught to do. I was taught that I came on in 1991 as a police officer. In July, it'll be 25 years. The first thing I was taught to get out in the community, to walk your beat if you could, to, to meet everybody out there, to shake hands, to get to know everybody. That's what I was taught to do way back then, almost 25 years ago. That's what police officers should be able to do now. Obviously, we have staffing issues that do not allow us to get out and do those things as much as we should. We hopefully will work on those staffing issues to get more police officers. But we definitely want to be out in the community. We definitely want to engage the community. We definitely want to work with the community, get their input on how we should do our job, but also explain to them how we do our job and why we do our job. There's accountability on all sides, and I believe that's the important catalyst to being, to, to being trusting, to trust each other, to work together, and to be able to move forward, and even with catastrophic issues that happen here and nationwide uh, between the police and the community. We have to be able to trust each other. We have to be able to give information to each other so that we can move forward from those and continue to build on that as we build, as we move forward. We all share the same air. We all share the same land. We need to be able to do that. Uh, I'm invested in this community 25 years. Uh, obviously, uh, AC Krebs is invested in here about 24, 25 years. We have an investment in this community as police officers. This is where we work. This is what we care about doing. We don't do this job to get rich because we won't get rich, and we're not trying to get rich. We do this job because we believe this is a job we should be doing. We should be out there with the community. We should be out there taking care of the community and listening to community input so that we can do our job better for the community. That's why I'm here today. Thank you. Hi, my name is Joanne Hardesty. Um, and uh, one hat I wear is as president of the NAACP Portland branch. Uh, and that's probably the hat I'll wear tonight. I saw Dr. Haynes come in. Dr. Haynes, your seat is up here if you'd like to come. Um, and so I'd like to start by saying that uh, we are all products of our environment. And so we live in a racist society. We have been experiencing racist practices as it relates to policing in the United States of America. And we have in Portland, Oregon, experienced our own deaths at the hands of Portland police officers. And so I just want to start with reality because I love that we want to do better, but I think we have to start with where we are. So you can't be a non-racist growing up in a racist country that devalues black lives. You can't, you can't, 
There's no way you could have grown up in the United States of America and not have absorbed the message that black lives somehow are worth less than other lives. So let's start from where we are. Where we are is a country in crisis. And if you don't think so, listen to the propaganda from the people who want to be president of the United States of America. So, uh, if we're going to deal with reality, we have to deal with that people experience policing differently based on where they live in the city of Portland. Now, I live in what they call the numbers, and so in my neighborhood, you never know what policing agency is, is zooming through. Because it could be Gresham Police, could be Portland Police, could be the Multnomah County Gang Task Force. Last night I saw this big three-story bus, right, that the police bought. They don't have any money, but they bought this big bus, three-story bus, that now rolls out of my neighborhood when they're on a crime scene. So when I hear the story about, oh, we're understaffed, I don't get nervous about that. Because I think we have to figure out whether or not we're using the resources we have today appropriately before we get crazy about needing to hire a whole bunch of more police officers. And we have to figure out if the culture that we have is the culture that the community wants. Because I actually remember the days when Portland police officers walked the street. I remember when they would talk to people in the coffee shops. But that's not the experience that I have out in the neighborhood that I live in. <clears throat> All I hear from the police in my neighborhood is that this gang infested, drug dealers are running rampant, prostitutes are out in the neighborhood. Ironically, it's the exact same message I heard from Portland Police Bureau when I lived in inner Northeast on 15th Avenue. The only difference is the complexion of the people who now live on 15th Avenue and now who live out in the numbers. So, I'd like to start the conversation from a point of, this is the world we live in. But I have hope. And I started my morning off with hope this morning, listening to Jim Wallace, an old white preacher man, uh, talk about his new book, America's Original Sin, Racism, White Privilege, and Bridging a New America. The only reason I keep coming back is that I have hope. The only reason I keep beating up on Portland Place Bureau is because I have hope. But I can't sit here and say that we're anywhere close to being where we need to be. Because yes, we have a COAB that's working on a very narrow slice of what is broken within Portland Police Bureau. The AMA Coalition is, not, is working on another slice of what's broken. I know that there are men and women inside the Bureau that are working on a slice of what's broken. I'm hopeful because Chief O'Day, one of his first acts was diversifying the command staff. Because the last police chief thought it was perfectly fine to have all white guys on his command staff. He didn't see any problem with that. But what the community saw was that policing didn't reflect the community that you're sworn to protect and serve. And so I, I, I'm still full of hope. I'm here. I'm ready to do the work. I've been doing the work for the last 20 years. I'll keep doing it. Um, but I'm not going to applaud the beginning of a process, but I am open to, we're only in year one of a five-year settlement agreement, so we can't be that far along yet. So uh, let's keep it honest and open and real. Thank you. First of all, I want to apologize for being late, uh, and we thank God for each of the panel members here and for this uh, forum on race talk. I'm the son of the uh, freedom movement. I um, 
been involved in civil rights and police community relations for over 40 years. And I've seen over those 40 years uh, uh, opportunity and difficulty. I've seen coming from the segregation south where uh, a black officer could not hold, could not arrest a white man. Uh, he had to wait until another white officer come to make an arrest. I've seen during the civil rights movement um, how men and women like Jimmy Lee Jackson were shot down by police officers and other law enforcement uh, watch uh, and observe as the Klan beat us as demonstrators for the challenge of gaining equal rights and some of the Klan being police officers. I, I've seen the progress in the terms of the history of opening those doors where uh, black officers could have full citizenship and could be fully represented within a police force and, and even go to the rank of chief. And that didn't happen uh, by uh, um, a denial of, of racism, a denial of racial bias. That happened because of the challenges of those civil rights workers of Martin Luther King and others that uh, pushed that and advocated for that opening of uh, equality and justice uh, for that. And so we are now at this particular point and that I believe that uh, Victor Hugo, the great French literary artist, said that when a, a time has come for an idea, uh, there's nothing on the force of heaven and earth can stop it. And a time has come for police accountability, and I, there's nothing that is going to stop that. The question is how are we going to bring that about in the process. I believe in community policing. I think since 9-11, we have departments across the nation have moved away from community policing and have moved more towards a warrior concept of a police officer rather than a guardian to protect and serve. Community policing to me is a very understand with the data from the FBI and other agencies that uh, there's no way, I don't care what the number of police are, can they patrol and adequately secure a community without the community participation and without community trust that takes place. Uh, and so what we have in community policing if died, and since 85% uh, of crimes are solved in our community through the participation of community people uh, pointing out or giving information on that. We understand that uh, the law enforcement part, the crime part, the other parts of, of law enforcement cannot work properly without the participation of the community. When we understand community policing and Albano Ministerial Alliance, we understand uh, in terms of full participation of the community. That is from recruitment uh, to, uh, in terms, training towards developing policy, towards monitoring the process, to in terms holding officers uh, accountable when there are mistakes praising them when they are doing the right thing and being able to differentiate the two. Community policing is something that we are going to, if we're going to solve this problem, we have to go back to that community engagement. Now we have components of community policing today, but there we have gone far away from a comprehensive plan. 
And so we need to go back in terms to the concept of looking as officers, as guardians, and the concept of the community as a partner uh, in, in terms of securing the community and in terms of protection in the community. And I believe that when we go back as we develop that ideal and flush that out, uh, we will begin to see the necessary changes. Now some changes have to in turn take place when we in turn have to demand certain changes. Frederick Douglass says that um, um, freedom does not come without a demand. Justice does not come without a demand. And so one of the things that has happened, we have an Obama Ministry Alliance Coalition for Justice and Police Reform. For the last 10 years, We've been working on various task committees inside the city and outside the city in terms of uh, developing a, a, a police reform within our bureau. We believe that we can have a better force. We believe that we can have better officers. We believe that we can have a better community. But it's going to, in turn, uh, be a process of holding each other accountable, accountable. Uh, and that means that uh, the, the officers can no longer in turn hide behind the blue silence. When incidents and abuse and uh, unnecessary use of force take place, if 90% of the officers are good officers, uh, we ask the question why is it so hard to point out and to get rid of those officers that are not good. And, and the community wants to know in the basis of what we call procedural justice is that fairness and justice has to be a part of that process. There has to be a process of healing. There has to be a process of cultural transformation within a bureau. And that cultural transformation is meaning that we have to get away from them and us. You know, a community cannot heal, a community cannot be a full community policing organization if on the one side those that wear the uniforms of blue that say that they are all against us. Or the community saying in turn uh, that they that wear the blue are all against us. We get into an antagonistic relationship that exists there. And one of the things that is hope that in the, the Department of Justice and the Settlement Agreement is a leveraging thing. It's not a panacea. It's not in no way in the world uh, uh, the Justice Department or anybody else can solve our problem but us. We have to solve our problems ultimately bet uh, between the police and the community here. But the Justice Department has given us a frame of reference that we can leverage to help create and to hold each other accountable um, as we begin <coughs> to shape and mold a bureau that will be fair, that will be just, that will respect community and the community will respect it. And the basic thing of human rights is that when you patrol a community, you have to respect those in the community. And the community has to respect you. And, and, and so when we move beyond that, and if we don't have the dignity of respect for each other, then we're going to have issues in our community. And so there must be a building process, a healing process that takes place, along with in terms of changes in policies and training, uh, changes in terms of uh, the whole community engagement that have taken place. And I believe that we have some of the framework, but we still have a long way to go. It's, it's up to us 
to partner together to make that difference. It is up to us to hold each other accountable. Uh, and this is the shaping of a future. The question is, what kind of police department do we want to have in Portland? And the citizens want to say they want to have a, 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 a police bureau that reflects them, a police bureau that, they, that is fair, that they can trust, and that is responsible. Thank you very much. Vice Principal came to me and said that the custodian was going to open up the rooms for us, maybe, but I haven't seen him. So, what I was thinking is that we should probably stay in here and then we can spread out all over the cafeteria. Uh, and so, if you look at what I'd like for you to be thinking about before we get started, is down at the bottom of the agenda are the community discussion questions. And we had a bunch more questions before, for those of you who have been here before, uh, and Kathleen simplified it down to three. We had these, but we had a bunch of others too. So uh, instead, we just made it real simple so we can share our information with Kathleen's group too. What do you see occurring presently in community and police relations? What would you like to see occur in community and police relations? And what are you willing to do to help improve community and police relations? You know that old bugaboo about you want to see change made, you have to be that change you want to see. <coughs> and topics to consider during your discussion are the six uh, topics that we had before. Police stops, racial profiling, interacting with youth, independent police review. Um, and for those of you who don't know, uh, how many of you know what the independent police review is? Okay, a few, no, about a third. All right, so the Independent Police Review is uh, in the auditor, city auditor's office, and if you have a complaint about the police, then you can go to them and they will review it. Now, Joanne and Reverend Haynes shared something very interesting with me. Joanne pointed out that, what, like 80%? Uh, Seventy-three percent of all the complaints that are filed are thrown out every year. Are thrown out every year, and Reverend Haynes pointed out that. Why are they thrown out, Reverend Haynes? A lot of them. Well, uh, the way the uh, IPR runs sometimes, uh, there's uh, a uh, criterion there is that uh, whether something is substantiated or unsubstantiated. <laughs> And the question is, how do you define that? And so, mm -hmm. sometimes it may not be, it could be a technical thing of a person not uh, following due on something. It could be in terms of the, uh, the registration <coughs> of the uh, uh, actual complaint that's being followed, or the uh, inability to recontact the person. It could be a variety of different so there's there's some technicalities that are that are involved in that 73 percent but we're trying to get ipr to have some more teeth and some cojones too so uh, that was a joke y'all but they, but they do yes sir okay just, you know, I, i'm not from ipr of course but is anybody from ipr here tonight no they're not okay. here uh, one of the things i know that uh, constantine severe... did they give you brochures to to bring for them no. Modica, did they give you brochures to bring? No, ma'am. Okay, there was. No, but I know that Constantine Severe is, is working with the Department of Justice on, right. on taking a close look at that, and, and I can't speak for them, but potentially revamping how they do intake and what cases are investigated or not. So they're, they're fully aware of this, and I know that Constantine, I can, uh, he's working on this to to make it more acceptable to the community. And some of the some of the cases that get thrown out are out of the, the purview of the Portland Police. Exactly. Thank you. And so that's that's what a lot of it is, too. No, a so, lot of it is they're homeless, uh, it's a race-based, he said, she said. Well, what I'd like to see us start doing is keeping statistics so we can really know what it is so we can start dealing with it. But Constantine was supposed to be here tonight and he wasn't able to come. So uh, we're gonna have you get involved during your group discussion, and then we're going to do a Q&A afterwards. Okay? Yes, I want to say something before people break for the group. Oh, yes. 
from the mayor's office? Yeah. Okay, you want to stand and say so it then? With regard to, um, you want to tell us who you are? Nicole Grant, analyst. So, with regard to the discipline process that currently is being revamped um, and reassessed by a group as AC Krebs just described, but the DOJ settlement specifically requires that going forward. Louder. The DOJ settlement agreement specifically requires that going forward, IPR is going to be like an accepting all, um, we're investigating all uh, complaints, so mm -hmm. they are no longer permitted to just like dismiss cases outright, so that is changing. Great. That's all. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. I said two things. One is not Kathleen's group. <coughs> it's your group. It's the Community Oversight Advisory Board, and it's a public meeting, and you can show up. The other part of that is, say, on this issue, you can show up and talk about this issue. What do you want to see? How do you want to see things work? <clears throat> it's really important that people come with ideas. And you don't have to know how it does work to say how you think it ought to work. You're invited. The next meeting is Thursday night at 530 at 525 Northeast Oregon. Is that, uh, where, where is that? Is that the Ambridge? Ambridge no, it's not the Ambridge Center. It's 525. It's called the Forum Building. It's our new office, and we couldn't get the Ambridge Center for the meeting. We'll go back to the Ambridge Center when we can. 525 Northeast Oregon. Entrance is on the south side of the building if you need an uh, uh, elevator. Otherwise, it's a door on the east side. But What's the cross street? Oregon and what? It's right across from the convention center. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right across from the convention, convention center. center. Okay. Okay. Two cars right there. All right. Okay. So the other thing is, uh, so the in independent police review, the community's role in oversight. What are you going to do to be a part of it? Kathleen just invited you to come and be a part of that. Um, hey, come and say it. And community p policing. What does community com yeah. what does community policing look like? What would you like to see it be like? And so there are all kinds of things that you can add to these discussions. So while you're looking at those three questions, you, you might want to focus in on all or none of these things. It depends on what you want to do and how you want to do it. Um, so since we do not have um, six different rooms to go to, they might be open, but I'm not trusting that we want to all tromp down there and then come back. Eric, did he say anything to you? No, he didn't. Okay, so we're here. So we've got the whole cafeteria. We've got, um, I think we've got till, what time did we say? Till 8 o'clock, so we've got an hour. Uh, I need, or do I have any facilitators who are here? People who, I see two facilitators. Are y'all staying till the end? You just volunteered, you know. Don't come up in here and think you, no, 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 no. You're facilitating participants, okay. All right, so anybody else? I've got Jiro, I've got three, I've got Carlos, that's four. Um, you, I, you know what, I love you. I love you. You are so brave. What's your name? Back here, what's your name? I can't, Erica? Caroline. Caroline. Caroline wants to be a facilitator. <laughs> so some of you other people who are a little older and can hold the pin up a little higher, maybe you need to speak up and get Caroline's guts. Okay, so we're going to split up into five different areas. I would like to have, let's get five of those. I like you. What's your name? <laughs> Jennifer. So I've got five facilitators. I've got five speakers. So... Um, Come get a set of markers and a, a pad and take notes. There are, uh, there's directions on how to conduct the small group discussion. So one person should be a recorder, the other one will be the facilitator, and everybody will help. So let's go corner, corner, center, one over there, one over here. You know, you people are all going to detention. <laughs> See, I caught your attention on that one. That's because they were not at the Kennedy School. I'm telling you, this is a tough crowd. Okay, so um, here's our first group. These are people that I like. They're reporting out. And these are the top two things that, they, that their group had. So please listen up. 
I think one of the one, two areas, one is to have hard conversations and dialogues in order to come to finding common ground. And then the other was to be comfortable with discomfort, that only change comes from being willing to move from your comfort zone into other areas and that we really need to be organizing ourselves as opposed to just simply not only having dialogue but also organizing ourselves. All right, let's hear it for that group. We especially need to hear it for that group because these people know how to follow directions. <laughs> Unlike some other people. Okay. President <laughs> Cotton excluded. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, our two report backs are. Um, uh, so I, let me ask a question before I do my report back. So, how many people know that if you are stopped by a police officer, that at the conclusion of that stop, they are required to give you a business card? How many people know that? So not enough. And so that came up at our table. Um, and so just thought it would be a great public reminder that uh, police are required to give business cards when they initiate a stop at the conclusion of that stop. And so we want to make sure that that's reinforced. We encourage the assistant chief to make sure that that is incorporated throughout the police bureau. And we wanted to remind, uh, okay. and just, we talked so about. Just, just a factual, they're only required if you ask them for a business card. That's not true. That is not, I was actually at the city council today that Rosie Sizer was required to make that happen. And it's supposed to be the police initiating getting the card. Yeah. The public is not supposed to have to ask for it. And so number two. Uh, is that we will have a new police commissioner in January of 2017. And, uh, and so we have a fear that just like when we had a new police commissioner come in the last time, the police contract was up for renewal. The police commissioner hadn't been in the job long enough to know what he didn't know about negotiating that contract. And so we, the public, have to educate people who want to be police commissioner on what the changes that need to happen in that police contract are before they take office so they are prepared to negotiate on our behalf. Thank you. These two people volunteer. Three more to go. I said, those two groups volunteer. Three more to go. Here, you, you want to do it back there? Uh, need you up front because the photographer is up here and you, you're going to be famous. See, see, something you need to think about is that, um, I, how many of you realize that the Attorney General of the United States is coming to Portland? And that they're going to be, and she's going to be talking with the Portland Police about community policing. This is part of what she's going to be talking about. And Jared and I, Jared who works for the Department of Justice, Jared, raise your hand, and he has a pocket full of cards. And in case he doesn't, then you've got the little piece of paper to get us info. Um, so that's part of what we're doing here. Okay. I didn't hear the instructions about picking two things. Um, and my group is kind of scattered. Really raise your hand if you're in my group around the room. So I just quickly underlined some of the themes that came up, um, the disconnect between um, police officers and the black community and poor communities, the lack of courageous conversations about what's happening in communities and that disconnect between the communities and officers, um, not knowing the experiences of people in those communities, um, and then a lot of discussion about the lack of opportunity to have relationships between officers and the community um, due to a variety of reasons, but wanting to have those relationships and be able to you know, know who's in our communities and things like that. So anybody else from my group want to add anything I didn't cover? Good? Okay. Thank you. Three down, two to go. So our group kind of worked towards community policing role um, as far as the discussion. 
goes. And I saw kind of two things that happened with it. Um, one, uh, that there is, there is, there is still bias. We still live in a society where um, white suspects are not are given the benefit of the doubt. That was definitely a big theme that we explored. Um, we had a nice, we had a story um, coming from one of our uh, participants that kind of alluded to that. Um, and then the other thing is just that it was a that this is a complex issue. It maybe goes a little beyond just as simple as police and citizens, that really it's a, it's a larger societal issue that we have to address. Um, you know, as Joanne said, you look at a part of town like, you know, the numbers are out in deep southeast or northeast, you know, you're, the city's annexed this part of the city in, but they haven't provided the infrastructure and the resources to care for that community. You can't have community policing without community. So, you know, that's something that the city needs to address on a larger scale. Um, in my opinion. Uh, but yeah, those are kind of two themes that we saw. Thank you. <laughs> We're the disobedient group that did not write. And did not write, and didn't want to be a facilitator, and Amen. didn't want to quit talking when it was time to stop. And doesn't want to be given a summary. <laughs> I think the most productive part of our conversation came when Katya shared with us a story of her personal experience with the impact of not having a translator available and how it affected a young person she was working with. Uh, so um, basically, I guess the question from this was not just how the, um, the police department can improve, but also like how the community can partner to support them. Because we know that a lot of this is coming from higher up, you know? The, the three gentlemen that were sitting with us, like I said, are not the ones making the big decisions. They're not the ones deciding where the money goes, right? So us as a community, to make that more important. The language? Huh? The, the language problem? The, the need for uh, bilingual support is, is really important here. Um, and so, yeah, so that was really what we came down to. And especially when we heard the stories about other situations many years ago where the lack of translators led to actual death. And here we are all these years later still talking about it. So where does the support for providing those kinds of resources come from? And what can we do as a community to be sure it's there? I, I just wanted to say that the reason I'm giving Christy such a hard time is because she trained me as a facilitator. So, uh, so I feel like I have the right to, to bug her. Okay, so our next thing is um, we, we're going to ask our panel to come back up and do a quick Q&A. And while the panelists are coming back up, panelists, please make sure you sign the poster. Because when all of you die, then I'm going to cash it into a lot of money because you're going to be rich and famous. And uh, so I want to make sure that I get that money and when I cash that poster. And that was a joke, you guys. This is a tight crowd. <laughs> okay, so if you have any particular questions that you would like to ask our panelists, please feel free to do that at this time. We're going to take about... 10 minutes to do that, 10, 15 minutes. And if you don't have any questions, then we'll go on to our next section. Yes, sir. I have a question. Uh, I've been you know, involved in this type of thing more and more, and I get to know very, how can I say, powerful people. And I feel like I'm start a little bit more power trip, like I have more power and I have more tripping there and I feel like I have less awareness. So how do you, how do you prevent these things? How, how do you do it? I'm very curious. I didn't oh, hear okay. the last part. Yeah. Okay. Prevent what? If I'm, I get more involved with these, uh, let's say, uh, human rights and um, how to governance and policing, then I start knowing more and more like uh, uh, more powerful people I used to, you know, I, I didn't meet. Mm -hmm. Then like I feel like I do have power. Mm -hmm. And that's great. I, feeling like I have, do have power is great. But the, 
that make me uh, less aware. Like I feel, I can't, I can't, I have less ability to notice who have less privileged people, who are marginalized people. I feel like I'm losing awareness around what's going on there. So maybe just only me, but if you have similar experience, I I like to know how do you keep awareness of uh, marginalized people? How do you pay attention even if you have lots of power? Well, I mean, you spend time in those communities, right? You spend time eyeball to eyeball with those people. Those are people that you interact with on a regular basis. Um, and so that's how you stay connected, right? It's very easy for people to get elected and then be disconnected from the people that they serve. It's very easy to have a title and make you think like you don't have to actually interact with regular people on an ongoing basis. Um, and so it's just really important to keep that human connection because at the end of the day, we're all human, right? Um, and just because they have a position or a title. And, and the other thing is that be fearless, right? Because I don't really care what their title is, right? I don't really care that they're a mayor or a city commissioner, right? If they're not doing the job, I'm going to tell them, right? So, it, you know, it, it, so you have, to, you, have to, uh, you have to keep the human connection. But also, don't be fearful because someone's got a title or they got a position, right? They're human just like you. They put their pants on the same way. And so if they're not doing the job that they were hired to do, as a community member, you've got a right to say, that's not what I hired you to do. I hired you to do something different. Thank you. That's good. When I went to work for the governor of Oregon, I wrote myself. When I went to work for the governor of Oregon, I wrote myself a letter. It said, Dear Kathleen, you are not a member of this club. <laughs> the minute you begin to try to be a member of this club, you will have forgotten why you came here. Love, Kathleen. <laughs> so so you, you be careful about the letter to read from people. That's how you keep our I think what I'm saying is know why you are doing what you are doing. If you know why you are doing what you are doing and you keep your eye on that and you have good people telling you when you have lost your way, you will be fine. Thank you. Just call it out. I, I have a question and uh, forgive my ignorance on this issue. Um, how important is training with diversity and empathy? Um, a lot of people come into the force as buddies and they form like their own little group and throughout the training and getting into the police force, they only associate with the group that they were in training with. So. Is there a way to make the training more diverse, or do you see that even as being an issue? I think first of all, the, the most important thing we do is, I talked about earlier when I first started about bringing in the right people. I think in order for us, we cannot train, there's a lot of things we can't train. We can't train, we can probably train compassion a little bit, but we want to bring people in that are compassionate and heartfelt, people that are caring, people that are decent human beings. And those are the kind of people we want to bring in, and then we can train them to be police officers. So I think it actually, I mean, training's a little bit of that, but I want, I can't train some things. I can't train integrity, I can't train compassion. I mean, I can talk about it, and, but I got to bring people in that have that. But with that said, once we bring them in, we do have uh, a lot of discussion about compassion. We have a lot of discussion about how we're supposed to uh, interact with folks. Uh, we talk to our officers about, um, about putting themselves and meeting that person where they're at. Right now, uh, actually Craig Morgan's in the room. Craig was, uh, played a big part in we had some equity and cultural competency training. We started at the chiefs, assistant chiefs, captains, commanders, lieutenants, and sergeants, and now we're moving into talking about cultural competency and equity 
with all the officers during this year's in-service was going to start sometime this summer. It will be about eight hours of that. So with me, and I know maybe there's some trainers that disagree, but my most important thing that I can do as the person in charge of personnel is bringing in the right people that aren't acting like they're better than everybody else, that actually care and will go out and meet the community face to face. And I know that the, the, the union feels the exact same way. Is this, We want folks they're actually human beings that can relate to folks and just decent human beings. Then we can train them. We can train them to drive. We can train them to how to write reports. Uh, we can train them how to, uh, you know, investigate, you know, crimes and stuff like that. But we start out with bringing the right folks in. And, and just to add to that, um, we're, we, we live in communities too, just like everybody else in this whole room. We live in part of the Portland community or Multnomah County. Uh, I live out in East County. Uh, I've coached youth sports. Uh, when my kids were home, now they're all in college, but we deliver meals on wheels. Uh, we do all those things. And there's a bunch of cops that do the same thing in their lives, uh, in their personal lives. So it's not that we, we just because we have this uniform on and we come to work every day, we don't lose our compassion. Or we don't, we don't uh, you know, all of us, I mean, we have friends that are police officers, that's true. And, and the people you come in with, you're, you're kind of joined at the hip. But I can tell you that we have a diverse amount of friends out there, just out there in the world that we've always had. So just like everybody else, we, we live in communities, we raise our kids in communities, in schools, and, and, and things like that. So it's not that we get this and this is this coat of armor that we have, that we're now finished with our lives as human beings and we go out and do something else and we're police officers 24-7. You know what, and I, and I tell people in orientations, uh, we, we meet with new officers in orientation, I tell them every day, I says, when you close that locker, leave it. Have friends and keep your same friends or keep friends outside of the bureau, but you still have friends inside of the bureau too because you have to have that balance in life. Like everybody else, doctors have doctors who are friends, lawyers have lawyers who are other lawyers, and also, but they also have those people outside. So we're not just, well, maybe lawyers don't have any friends, but, 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 but most people do have, you know, they have friends that are outside of what they do, but you're always going to have those people that are friends in your profession too. So, and it helps because when you have issues that you want to reach out to somebody, you feel like you can reach out to people in your profession, they understand the dynamics and you're able to talk those through. And that's how you keep that compassion and you keep those feelings and you keep that respect for people is because you go out, you not only have those people outside of your profession, but also inside of your profession. So. Yeah. I want to say that training is critically important as a uh, former cultural diversity training in the Dallas Police Academy. Uh, I find that training is critically important, um, especially uh, in the Northwest where most of the officers have not necessarily had any kind of cultural experience with uh, the African American community or necessarily with the Latino community. Uh, it's critically important that uh, officers begin to understand the culture of the diverse communities that they exist in. And also, a training is not just a, uh, on one level, tactical training is critically important. Should an officer ever put himself in the front of a car, like what happened with Kendra James? Should I have those kind of training aspects of it? But also in terms of being able to engage with the community leadership, one of the things we are proposing in a new training in the academy here is to uh, have community leaders, indigenous of various ages, to be able to go uh, and to help train uh, in the uh, um, uh, academy and, and be able to engage officers before they ever hit the street. That's critically important. We also have to remember that uh, uh, two-thirds of our officers in the Portland Police Bureau don't live in the city limits. I've been training for 40 years at Oakland University. Training in this area is not an intellectual in exercise. And when I hear that somebody's going to get eight hours worth of training on cultural diversity, I'm going, no, they're not. <laughs> they're going to get some information that they may be able to use sometimes, occasionally, but they will not make the emotional shift necessary to do empathy. And empathy is what we're talking about. I see you in me. 
I see me in you. So when we're talking about training, we're also talking about implicit bias. We're not talking about people who are walking around going, hey, 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 I'm really white and I'm bad and you, you're black and you're bad. I mean, I'm tough and you're bad. We're talking about people that don't even know the biases they have. And so you can't surface those in eight hours. You can't get a good conversation going in eight hours. It's going to take you at least 16 to get started. And then maybe after the end of the week, you will have something that you can say is a shift. Because people have felt something different, or they understand something on a different level. When I tell you that I rode the back of the bus in 1947 in Nashville, Tennessee, if you didn't ride the back of the bus, you may not know what that feels like. But you do know what it feel, humiliation feels like. You do know what shame feels like. You do know when you're being punished for something that you don't understand and makes no sense to you. And that's the level I want you to connect with me on, on that level. Not this, yes, her grandmother was a slave. Hey, that doesn't do anything for you to understand where I am right now standing here. That may help inform how you feel. But what I want you to do is be me. And that's going to take more than eight hours. Amen. Okay. So, to add to this discussion, one of the things that uh, I am going to be working on this next year with the police department is to try is to get course credit and to see if we can change the licensing for officers to be required to do diversity training that every year officers should do at least 15 hours of diversity training in order to be, and, and I've been told they don't have to be relicensed, and which I find is just phenomenal, uh, because as a teacher, we have to be relicensed all the time. So um, I think that the responsibility is at one, you know, it's the same kind of thing. One of the things that I think is important is to for people to be in discussions that are non-threatening. And race talks mm -hmm. is a great way to get started. It's not the only way, but it's a place to come to get started. And so those are discussions that people are getting to be educated, to hear what's going on, and to hear from people in the community, and hear from random people who come to the, to the meeting. You can hear what people have to say, and you can stay connected to the community, and it can help to open up pathways in the brain and in the heart that weren't open before. So, that's something I'm going to be working on this next year. Are there any other? Yes, ma'am. I want to say something. I left it off my notes here. I mean, I didn't get to that part. The piece that is not being discussed thoroughly and in depth is the culture of the police, the institution that exists and that is the same over time. There is a view that says, if we fire this chief, we'll have a better police force. No, that's not what's happening. It's the whole thing that's got to change. So what does the culture of the police look like? What's in there? How are we going to find out? You can take somebody who comes, it's like the culture of the social worker. Comes into a job to do good. 10 years later, cranky, yeah. hard to get along with. What happens? What is, what is that mechanism in there that changes that heart or steals it or makes it feel alone and unable to do the thing that it came for in the first place, which was to be a good human being and give things to other people? So the coach of the police is another piece of that that needs to be talked about. There's a hand back there. Sorry I came in late. My name is John Slaughter. I'm a former teacher, education and community activist now. A uh, question for you, you five, you five have been in Portland for a number of years. The um, question I have for you is, how do individuals have the courageous conversations with police officers or individuals who can affect or talk to police officers? Um, I, I fully agree. It's the culture that we need to change. And uh, I say that because uh, I have courageous conversations with police officers all the time. Uh, I know one big guy, I see police officers and I walk up to them and I have a conversation because I want them to see me and know who I am, number one. Also, I want to engage them in verbiage, number two. I had a conversation with a police officer, he told me that I, I shouldn't say or perpetuate the verbiage of walking while being black. And so as a person who identifies himself as a black person, I'm mixed, thank you so much. I should give you that verbiage because it's verbiage that has been happened for a reason, profound. 
So how do we how do we engage police officers or individuals to have those crazy conversations to continue more learning or understanding between cultures? I, I think just keep doing what you're doing, like you said. Uh, you know, in any well, not not only for me because I'm educated, I'm fine. But no, no, I mean for people in general, the people in general, everybody else in general. I mean, I'm, I said keep doing what you're doing, but people doing what you're doing. Have those conversations. I would also say that uh, many people don't feel safe just walking up and starting a dialogue and conversation with a police officer. And there's really good reasons to not feel safe and feel like you can kind of walk up and just like, hey, what's up, dude? How's, how's the day going? Um, I think it's better for people to join organized groups uh, because there's power in numbers. Um, and then the more people you have in the group, uh, the better the product is that you will come out with. Um, I think it's important that uh, whether it's with the AMA Coalition for Justice and Place Reform, whether it's with the NAACP Portland Branch, whether it's with Portland Cop Watch, whether it's with Black Lives Matters, find a group because we're all much more powerful if we're working cooperatively together for a common cause. Um, and I will say uh, uh, that young people that I talk to are very fearful of starting that conversation. And so the more we adults can create facilitated conversations where we can have young people sit with police officers, uh, like how many years ago was that that we did the listening sessions? That was like in 2006. We had a series of community listening sessions where the police and the community came together. We had one that was youth focused that the youth led. Um, it's powerful when you give kids the mic and say, handle it, you know, uh, put the program together, we'll support you. And that was the best listening session that we had because the youth were uh, in control and they were absolutely wonderful. Um, and so I think we need to create more of those kind of opportunities. But we have to create the opportunities for honest conversations, right? Mm -hmm. I, you know, I've been to too many of those conversations. Here's the PowerPoint. We did nothing wrong. Any questions, right? It, that's useless. It doesn't work for the police. It doesn't work for the community. So let's figure out a way to have those conversations in a way that's meaningful and that we really hear what people's lived experience has been, right? Because you haven't lived my experience. I haven't lived yours. And we should be respecting each other's stories because that's our lived experience. No, I have a little bit of a different view. I think it's all good ideas, Joanne. But I, I think I like Sir. I, I, I would welcome someone just to walk up and start with conversation. I don't know about about a month ago, two months ago, I was just walking back from the justice, or actually from City Hall over the Justice Center. I walk up, I see a gentleman standing there by the bus stop. Him and I just started chatting. Start having a good conversation. I, I know this guy from Adam. Next thing you know, he's in my office. Him and I decided to walk into my office. I didn't have a business card. Uh, I actually, I go, let me give you my card. And I start looking. I don't have a card. I go, uh oh. And so, next thing you know, I said, Sir, why don't you come to my office with me? So, him and I went to the office. I went in there and introduced him to the chief of police, went inside there and just said hi. So, I, I personally, and I think every police officer in this room would welcome anybody just to come and just start chatting us up. I mean, oftentimes it's. Uh, I find it very welcoming, but I think anyone in this room, I, I can probably speak for every officer here, they would have no problem with people chatting about because it's that first icebreaker. I must admit, it is kind of fearful. I went to uh, New York City to visit my son, and there was a police officer there, and I'm asking myself, well, do, I, do I dare say something to him? <laughs> you know, I thought, well, yeah, I think I could probably say something to him. How are you doing today, sir? And he wasn't that communicative. He wasn't he was like talking, but. But uh, I, even I had this little hesitancy, even as a police officer, you know, how do I approach this guy? Is he going to be offended? Is he going to want to talk to me or not? So I see people's, you know, maybe some fear of that, but most of what you'll find is we're just regular human beings that are just trying to get along like everybody else. And I think that once you walk up and shake that hand, I think that barrier, I believe, and the expectation is the officers would just, would just fall and you would have a good conversation. That's kind of my thing. Can I can I add something to that? Um, so it, a lot of it depends, though, if you see yourself in the policeman, if you see yourself in that policeman, 
Um, I'll give you an example. Um, if I see somebody walking down the street in a walker, I could, I could automatically connect with them. I know what they're dealing with, I know what they've been through, and I could engage in a conversation with them. If, if a black person sees a white person, they can't really have a, a white policeman. They can't really have that instant interaction or instant feeling of camaraderie. So there's got to be some kind of bridge that needs to occur. Um, you know, maybe the policeman starts a conversation or something like that in order to break, break the ice a little bit. I was just going to say the difference between not having a weapon and being weaponized from head to toe, yeah. Yeah. right? I'm not walking up to somebody that's got weapons all up and down both arms and legs and say, hi, want to chat? Yeah. Yeah. Right? That, 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 that's not a realistic expectation of the public. But it's very intimidating, especially, I mean, even if I know that I've not done anything wrong and I know yes. that I'm in a position of privilege, I mean, it's like walking up to a soldier. Right. Like, I mean, look at his, I mean, look at his just, vest. It, I mean, too, it creates a barrier. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that, you know, I applaud the officers that are here because, you know, you're, you're coming to a forum to have this discussion, mm -hmm. but you are not all police officers, right? So would I feel comfortable engaging one of you that I've now met and seen in this type of forum? Absolutely. But somebody that I've never met, no. <laughs> I mean, I just from an honest perspective, so I can't even begin to imagine someone who's not in my position of privilege to to be able to do that and feel comfortable. Well, I have done it. <coughs> Being slightly crazy, I do walk up to him, totally geared up. I don't care. Uh, I can only die one time. So I walk up to people and I say hello, and my experience has been is they get a little defensive because if I'm not afraid of them with all that they've got on, and then who am I and what is it I'm bringing? And I'm not coming in a negative way. I'm coming in a, um, a friendly human, this is me, I'm okay, and clearly you're okay too, and if you're not, then that's your problem. But that's intimidating to people when you think you're okay. And uh, some people, I, I think police join the force kind of, since I'm a teacher, I can say this, that there are, there are three main categories of people who join the police force. And one of them is people who want to change the world. And I won't go into what the other two are. There's a whole lot of things, but there's, there's some other categories there too. And, and, and some are coming from a position of, this is going to build me up. And some are coming from a position of I've already built up and it's going to add to what I have. Uh, and then there's those people who, who are, I call the mighty mouse, you know, I'm going to change the world and make it a better place. And um, I just think that if you approach people the way that you want to be approached, then it's real hard for them to not come back at you that way. And I have had any number of people who were bigots, believe me, I worked in a place where there was a ton of them. Not a ton, it was a whole county, whole surrounding counties, you know, and, and I stood out like a sore thumb in that county. And I, I was me. I did me and, you know, you get to know people and people have to accept you. But if you come with fear, it's like, it's like you know, they say if a dog can sense that you're fearful, so can other human beings. Yeah. So if you act fearful, then they're going to think, well, maybe there's a reason for you to be afraid. Maybe there's something that you're bringing. Come at it like you're not afraid. Come at it like, hey, you're just, we're just the same thing. I yeah, you got gum. I think you're putting too much pressure on the community yes. to be the proactive one when these people are loaded with weapons. Oh, I understand. I understand. But, but I'm not saying that. I, I'm not a police person. So I can't, can't come to, and say, because if I was a police person, I'd come to the community and do the same thing. I mean, I'm just being me. 
But I'm just saying, if you are a community person, you cannot always sit back and wait for them to come to you. It may or may not happen. Okay, so I'm going to stop the conversation for a second. No, 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 no. I'm stopping it because I want you to have the time to talk to other people. So here we go. I shouldn't have said nothing. I'm sorry. Okay, so here's a quickie. Race Talks next, um, next month is March 8th, I believe it is, at Kennedy School. And then um, May, March 20th, 28th, did I say? at uh, Cleveland High School. Um, that might be changing to a different location, but you know, people don't want to go to Cleveland and breathe over there. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we might be changing to another location. So anyway, um, so we'll keep you in the, in the uh, loop about that. So two things I want you to do, please. Please fill out your evaluation. That is very important. I will be sharing it with is it Grant, I got promoted. What are you? You got promoted. <laughs> How do I uh, we're gonna split the. We're gonna split the pay rate. Okay. So uh, we'll, I'll be sharing that with him very shortly, and also the notes. Uh, we'll do that. And this is networking time. This is a chance for you to walk around, talk to people, share your ideas, exchange cards. And Jared is over here. He's with the Department of Justice. Ms. Kathleen is over here. She is the chair of the Community Oversight Advisory, Advisory Board. Board. <laughs> Who? Reverend Haynes is part of the oversight for the Department of Justice. The first, this is the first community organization that's had oversight in the country. So this is important stuff. So if you have people you want to hook up with, talk to, get their number, give them yours, you're in this room, you have my permission to charge up and say hi. All right, so well, thank can you I make so, one more so much. Yes, ma'am. The COAF has as one of its charges the development, working with the Fort Hill Police Bureau to develop a community engagement plan. Got ideas? Look on our website, COCO COAF. Look for the community engagement uh, subcommittee meeting. Come and bring your ideas. John was there last time, good discussion. How would you like to see the Portland Police Bureau engage with the community? We need ideas. All right, thank you for coming. <laughs>